Okay, welcome to the uh, December 16th edition of the Paper Boys. Um, I'm sports editor Doug Newhoff, and I'm joined by uh, assistant sports editor Jim Sullivan and sports writers uh, Jim Nelson and Nick Pateros this morning. Uh, some things came to an end last week, and uh, some other things are really kind of only beginning. Uh, let's start with uh, you and I football. Um, the Panthers couldn't quite get over that uh, bump up at North Dakota State. Uh, another really uh, hard-fought football game. It was really a lot of fun to watch. Um, two good teams not giving an inch, uh, more or less. Um, a couple of big special teams plays. Ultimately swung it toward North Dakota State and uh, knocked the Panthers out in the uh, quarterfinals of the FCS playoffs. Nelly, you were there. I mean, what are your takeaways? Well, you know, they played a great first half. They might have, they could have possibly even up by more that, at the half, yeah. and, and that might have came back and haunt them a little bit. But the play that I thought wouldn't haunt them as bad as it did was the kickoff return. I mean, it wasn't ideal to have uh, Bruce Anderson go 97 yards in the first uh, on the opening kickoff of the second half. But uh, you look at it, there's 29 minutes and 45 seconds to go, and you're only down by you're only down by four. So I thought, okay, well, they just got to recover. But then it was three and out, and they never, and they never seemed to recover from it. And, well, the kickoff return, too, they had him all there. They had six guys surrounding him, and the next thing you know, he spun out of there and he was gone. Yeah, they had him tackled several different times, or yeah. it appeared to, and the way he went. So, yeah, it was just one of those things. I don't, they couldn't find any rhythm on offense. You know, I thought, I, if there's one thing I took away, and the opening drive of the game, they had they hit four or five, or four, they were 4-4. Four, four. Bailey was 4-4 four, four passing, and they were all short little passes. I don't, and I don't think they tried that until late in the second half, and they kind of got away from that. I don't know if it was... They were buried a little bit. Their uh, North Dakota State's punter had a huge game and pinned them a lot deep, and that takes away maybe some of those, uh, you know, throws out on the boundary. You don't want to try that out on the boundary when you're down inside your five. So, but I thought they, they kind of got away from that with, when they had success in their only real super long scoring drive. Yeah, the question that was sort of the question I would have is, uh, um, did uh, the not the absence of a passing game, but the the, the sort of flawed flaws in the passing game really hurt you and I? You know, especially in the second half of that game. Yeah, um, it, it, they weren't going to get the run. North Dakota State was, they, they were going to go ahead yeah. and throw. And, mm -hmm. you know, they did try a couple deep shots, but it was on back to back plays. And, you know, they were, I think one kick was close and one was overthrown. But uh, it was, yeah, North Dakota State was keyed up there and they played what? It was fantastic team defense. And I think that's what North Dakota State is. I mean, they had a guy for Bailey and they had a guy for Tyrus Smith. Yeah. And they didn't get a lot of tackles for losses, but he was getting, they were getting hit at the line of scrimmage. And in the first half, too, the, I mean, and Aaron Bailey hit it. There was about four or five plays where they were a shoestring away from going a long way. And North Dakota State got a hand on the shoestring and brought them down. And that could have been a huge thing, too. Um, and then there's another point. And it wasn't a big factor, but after United goes up 7 nothing, the first North Dakota State play, they try to throw a pass off the flat. It's batted up in the end zone. And if... Uh, A.J. Allen doesn't slip. He picks that off, and boom, boom, they could have been up 14 nothing right off the bat. I don't think, I mean, that's an end uh, if or but, you know, but uh, it was one of those things, boy, if he doesn't slip going for that interception, he would have, uh, it could have been a huge right off the gate up a couple scores. So, yeah. Yeah, it, let's give North Dakota State, I mean, the credit mm -hmm. that they're due. I mean, they did make those open field tackles, and uh, they ran down some guys um, that I didn't know that they, if they could run down yeah. or not in the open field. And, um, made all the plays that they needed to make, and you and I didn't get uh, those those long runs or those you know those breakaway plays that they had gotten in the previous two games, or actually quite often in their seven game winning streak. So that was yeah, that was a big thought when I was going into this game is if North Dakota State makes them drive every time, is you and I going to be able to do that? And they weren't. And and looking forward, I mean, uh, you see uh, an offense this year that was supposed to be much more sophisticated and uh, wide open. Um, uh, I guess we had, a, we were led to believe there were going to be great changes. Um, and really, I, I saw a lot of what I saw when Terrell Reddy was the quarterback. I mean, a handful of plays um, and not much of a downfield passing game. I mean, I, I think that that's got to develop for this team to, to get over that bump and take the next step. Yeah, I, one of the problems they had all year, and Nelly can speak to this better than I can, I think was the wide receiver core. I, I fully thought that, that Darius Fountain and Charles Brown would really emerge this year, especially Fountain. And to some degree it happened, but, but to some degree it didn't. They never really seemed to develop any depth. Uh, sometimes Fountain was huge, sometimes he wasn't. Charles Brown had some critical drops, especially early in the year. And, and I have to believe that, that if, as you said, they, they want to develop that passing game, and why wouldn't you, that they're going to have to go out and find some receivers somewhere. They're going to have to either, I mean, some guys are going to play right now. Junior college guys, uh, FBS transfers, 
something like that. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, in the in the fall, in summer and August, we were expecting this, you know, hurry up, you know, let's go, we'll, we'll throw it around a lot. And somewhere around the Illinois State game, I think that vanished. We, that, we just didn't see that again. And it'll be interesting to see what happens now going forward. It, will they stay with this? Will they try to incorporate more? And what does it say about what Joe Davis's uh, future is at, at you and I? Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times when I watched uh, the games on television when they were available, um, you and I's receivers don't get any separation. I mean, they were other teams were able to man them up. Even Darius Fountain, as good and as fast as he is, um, had a hard time getting separation. So uh, Bailey, a lot of times, was trying to throw into a window that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. You know, and that's the thing. They got the receivers got to get open a little more. And uh, maybe they have to find somewhere else. They can get them open more, or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, they just weren't. And they, I think they had the skill guys there. You know, Darian Miller. They moved him to flanker midway through the year. And, he was elusive, and so it's kind of like a Charles Brown guy, probably with a little bit better maybe uh, hips or moves or whatever. And they, they didn't get a lot open. You know, even on the pass, they did try to go downfield in this game. They didn't get open. And the one long one they threw to Fountain late in the fourth quarter there, that was more of a scramble and throw it up. And I think uh, North Dakota State had given up on it a little early. You know, so they, yeah, they got to find someone. I know uh, Coach Barley on Monday said they got to go find some receivers. I know they redshirted a bunch this year. We'll see if any of those guys can emerge or got better. Or... Somewhere out there, there's another Kenny Shedd or Dieter yeah. Ward or I mean, somebody who can get behind a defense. And... Yeah, just watching that game on TV, it surprised me. Before the safety, you had three consecutive drives that ended on runs on third and long. They weren't even trying to, to throw a, an eight-yard pass route there. Mm -hmm. And it was a low-risk approach, I mean, no doubt. But, yep. Um, moving forward, um, now it's time to recruit. Uh, you know, obviously they've got to replace that secondary with DeAndre Hall and uh, Tim Kilfoy and uh, McIntyre Dorleant. Those guys were pretty darn good football players. Um, they have some good pieces coming back. Uh, I think Brett McMakin is one of the best linebackers in FCS. Jared Farley's not far behind, and uh, Carter Schultz really had a breakout year. So they've got some some marquee type players coming back. Um, what else do they need? Well, you know, like I said, they got some guys in the, the defensive back really got experience. You know, uh, Jameson Whiting has started some games. He played a lot this year. Damon Hendricks played a lot this year. DJ Singleton, um, and I'm forgetting another is guy. Is Buchanan back? Does he come back or is he done? Bray Buchanan Jr. is back. Yeah. Edwin, so Edwin, Edwin Young's a senior, yeah. so he graduated. So those guys are back. Defensively, after that, I think they could be okay. They need some depth. They need some depth at linebacker after McMakin. And uh, I think Deshaun Dexter's back, too. So the whole linebacking crew is Dexter. Um, Farley, McMakin, McMakin could, I mean, he, uh, he might be one of the best linebackers they've had. Um, just he makes plays all over the place, his size and his speed. Yeah, he's good. And then up front, you know, they lose, they lose Isaac Ailes and I think, and Ronnie McNeil, but I think they're returning the bulk of that with a lot of guys they got experience, so they're going to be okay there. What they need on offense, uh, they lose Jacob Rocklocker, but I think the way they rotated in, I think Justin Putney will move over, Ratchy will come back in, Twait goes back to left tackle. Moving uh, Chris Schluger and I think one of the guards. They're going to have all those guys back. The whole uh, Bailey's back, Titus Smith's back. The big, the big missing part there is they got they have all the receivers back, but I think they need to find a couple more to play because they really played about four guys I think in that game. Brandon Smith caught the first touchdown pass, but other than that, I don't know if a lot of receivers. But they lose two senior tight ends, so and they got a redshirt freshman and they got Elias Neeson that played a little bit this year. So I'm thinking that they're out in the junior college ranks right now trying to find a, a tight end or two that can come in and block. I, I think Elias Neeson's sure. going to be really good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I'm sorry, that, that this, going next year, they're in the best position offensive line-wise that they've been in in years, I think. with the, It seems like the discussion we've had with them is they're always looking for a couple pieces, a couple starters. This year, I think, with, with Twait and some of the guys you mentioned coming back, they are in very, very good shape going forward, especially compared to some of the question marks they've had in, in recent years. Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, the coaching staff? Are they pretty uh, solid there, or will there be some movement? There, there tends to be, I guess, this time of year. Yeah, they, like the coach said, there tends to be some movement. You know, when all these FBS jobs are filled, there seems to be some filter on people leave and get, you know, they get to go to an FBS school or something. I'm assuming he's had a pretty, he's had some movement just about every year here for the last three or four years. They're still up in the air. What they're, what's going to happen with Ben Barkema and his legal situation? Uh, he's been, he was suspended there late in the year and is still suspended. Is he going to be back? Because he did a great job with the offensive line, and they continued on without him. But, boy, he built that offensive line into what it is. So do you reprimand him? What do you do? Do you bring him back? Or do you let him go? Uh, we'll find out there. But I'm, I'm guessing they might. some guys might get some chances at some FBS schools that will move on, young guys that maybe get a little more money. Or 
or something, and, and there'll be some movement. But I think for the core, I think they're going to give Joe Davis a second year. You know, I think you got to give him a second year, and you got to like what the defensive guys have done. And, um, so yeah, we'll see that. That'll play out here probably in the next two or three weeks. Yeah, a lot of the uh, F uh, BS positions are getting filled in now, so um, it's time for the trickle down. We'll see what we'll see what happens there. But let's talk a little bit of basketball now. Um, so you're just back from a uh, trip to the East Coast uh, with the Panthers, uh, split two games at what Richmond and George, George Mason. Mason. Um, looked pretty good at times. Hit a couple of bumps in the road at times, and then they've got a big game this week. So yes, they do. Um, they're in the middle of this really long stretch away from the clouds. They're about halfway through it. Um, they have now. They played uh, at New Mexico on Saturday. They have a neutral site game with Iowa State. I think they have one more. Well, they go to Hawaii here uh, over the holiday break, and then it's finally home on December 30th, I believe, with Bradley. Um, it's been, as you said, up and down. Uh, they did not play well at Richmond. They seem to have a terrible time matching up with Richmond, figuring out uh, the matchup zone. <coughs> Richmond had a big night shooting-wise. Uh, they, the, their big kid Klein inside cleaned up. Terry Allen was good both inside and out. And the, the George Mason game was peculiar. If only when you get out-rebounded on the offensive board 23-8, as Ben Jacobs said, you should lose, and somehow they didn't. Um, you know, that, that was all because of Washburn, Jesperson, and Bohannon. Those guys literally carried the team in the second half, did a great job, and they came out with a victory. Uh, then on to New Mexico, where those guys really didn't, couldn't do it, and you can't expect them to do it all the time. And they struggled offensively. Defensively, I think they, they, they struggled again. Who knows? Fatigue, road weariness. We, we don't know that, and I don't think Ben Jacobson is making some excuses. Meanwhile, uh, Arius Austin leaves uh, to go to a, a, another school somewhere, which was a bit of a surprise, because up till New Mexico, he had been getting playing time. Now the rotation shortens, and now it'll change in some way, shape, or form that even Ben Jacobson couldn't determine uh, Monday with, with good reason. So uh, the Iowa State game uh, coming up this Saturday, the Big Four Classic, is interesting for that reason, and also because Iowa State's got some shuffling to do. Right. As Mitchell Long is, is gone for the year, apparently. Uh, uh, Deontay Burton's coming in, big 6'4", 250 hits. So uh, how all that will pan out, I guess we'll find out. But certainly, um, it's, it, there are some matchup problems there that you and I will have to figure out before uh, Saturday night. Um, yeah, what does Deontay Burton bring to the Iowa State mix? Um, Size, huh? Size, well, yeah, I think that's a, he's a guy that that's apparently has some, some pretty good vertical to him. He likes to hang around the rim. There is a video of him out there somewhere at uh, the, the, their, their version of uh, Midnight Madness at, uh, at Hilton with that dunk contest, and he was dunking in boots, for whatever that means. Uh, so apparently in tennis shoes, he's pretty good at getting up in the air, and we'll all find that. But he's also a well-put-together guy. He's as solid a 6'4 guy as you'll see. Um, so exactly how they'll use him in, in, in Long's absence, I don't know. But uh, beyond all that, they still have the, the matchup problems that we've seen and a number of teams have over the years with Iowa State. George Yang can, can do anywhere, go anywhere and shoot anywhere, and he's dangerous passing the ball. And now uh, Jameel McKay, whom the Panthers did not see two years ago, is there. He presents another set of matchup problems on both ends of the floor. And then, of course, you have Monte Morris, arguably the best point guard in the country. So there's all that to worry about, and how you and I will deal with all that, uh, we'll find out. Uh, one thing I don't see with Iowa State is a ton of, of depth. Uh, they've right. got a couple players they can bring in, but uh, they're not uh, particularly deep. I think you, uh, rebounding will be an issue in this game for you and I. I mean, they have to find a way to at least be close on the, on the boards. Um, they can't be giving away too many second chances and easy baskets. Uh, defending Iowa State uh, hasn't been easy for anyone. Won't be easy for you and I. Um, I think you and I should put up some points, though. I mean, that's a, a team that's shooting 40% from three-point range, and uh, Iowa State has not been a, a very good defensive team the past couple games. That's a good, very good point, because my one of my takeaways from uh, watching the Iowa Iowa State game here a week ago, um, I didn't think Iowa State had a lot of interest in what took place at the defensive end. I mean, they were more about getting down the court and getting up shots. Um, there is no way you should ever let Jared Utah get off for 30 points in one half. And most of those shots were not contested. You know, a handful were, but for the most part, he was shooting wide open um, in transition. And um, then, as was Peter Jock a little bit later when uh, they started to get the ball into his hands. So, you know, I think uh, you're right. I think I, you and I can score some points, and they're going to have to. Yeah, one of the keys there will be the, uh, as, as, as Jake would like to call them, the young guys inside of Cook, uh, uh, Ted Freeman, and Clint Carlson. Uh, 
one of those guys is going to have to do a good job on the board. Uh, I think Cook will probably get a little bit of duty on, uh, on Jamil McKay, and they'll also, I think, be asked to help whenever Niang decides to go down to the low block. They can't get in foul trouble. They have to block out, and I think they need to score some points. I, I don't think they can get by without the, some of those guys contributing, I don't know, 12 to 15 points at least. That's going to be big. They'll take some of the pressure off Washburn and Bohannon. Uh, Jesperson was in it when he's on the perimeter, and, and Jerry Morgan, who also needs to step up his offensive game a little bit, I think. And we know he's capable. We've seen, yes. it, seen it in the past. I mean, he's, he's yeah. a good offensive player when that's his focus and so forth. Um, just let's touch briefly on you and I women's basketball. Um, it's kind of like one step forward, one step backward for the Panthers early this season. Mm -hmm. And now they've lost Ellie Herzberg, who was, I think, maybe their first player off the bench and playing quite a few minutes. Um, what's that mean for them going forward? Well, they, they lost Herzberg. They get Alyssa Johnson back, I believe, who will give them some depth in the in the front court. But yeah, that'll that'll kind of weaken their their back court or their guards that they can bring in off the bench. Um, and you're gonna have to see more out of a, a Madison Weekly, uh, see more out of um, uh, you know an Amber Sorensen, some of those other players that that can shoot from the wing. Um, Stephanie Davison, Angie Davison. I think Angie Davison, uh, the younger sister of Stephanie Davison, is gonna be the one that they're gonna kind of uh, have fill that role maybe a little more. Herzberg, uh, her, her big thing was uh, she's just really quick, a good defender, could get, get, get to the hoop, and they don't have a lot of players on the team that were doing much inside the arc. Uh, it's a three-point shooting heavy team. Um, in the games they lost, they haven't gotten a lot out of Jen Keitel, their, their center, and I think that's been kind of their, their linchpin. When they're getting good production out of her, they're, they're having a lot of success. Didn't they throw four, up 43 pointers in that uh, Mac? Well, yeah. Yeah, they're not, a, they're not afraid to shoot it, that's for sure. Um, yeah, they let it fly. Um, and, and that's probably the reason why they have so, such drastic runs. I mean, they'll go uh -huh. on a 23-5 to 5 run in their favor, and then they'll go five minutes without scoring. And, yeah. Um, that's, got, that's a hard way to play basketball. It's a, yeah, it's a streaky thing. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it, it, makes it makes it for exciting basketball. But, yeah, they're, I don't know if you can be consistent in doing what, doing what they've been doing. So you, they're going to have to get more production, I think, out of that front court with Kaido and some of those players to, to, to really kind of stabilize things. How much is their small guard hurting them? Because I know Weekly and Shanae Lamar, Lamar yeah. they're 5'2", they can get to the paint. The problem mm -hmm. is they're getting the paint and they're looking at somebody that's a foot taller than them. Yeah. Has that been an issue too where they, they've been able to drive, they just haven't, they can't finish? I saw it more in the past with Lamar. It, and her shooting percentage was terrible heading into the season. And she put a lot of time in and actually has become a little bit better shooter. And I think that's helped a lot. But um, defensively, she's probably one of their top defenders. She gets so many steals, she's so quick and get all over the place. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, once she gets inside, it, you know, it, it's almost like she's a pass-first type guard. And, and if the, you get a tall defense that can collapse around, that's going to hurt them. The, the thing that helps them is in the Missouri Valley Conference, you don't see th those matchup issues aren't as exploited as, as they are in some of those non-conference games where you're going up against the Iowas and Iowa States of the world and, and seeing a lot of that height. So. The question I would have, Nick, about, about Keitel, when you brought up, is she fully healthy? Is the, is the knee injury behind her, do you think? Is that yeah, I, I, thought, I thought she looked real good in a couple games mm -hmm. earlier this season, and then I saw a stat line the other night where she went scoreless so and, and played big minutes. So I, I, and then she didn't look good against Iowa. She just got outplayed, I think, by Iowa's center, that Chase Coley. Um, so, yeah, I, I just think it's just kind of she's been a little inconsistent. But great great player, great work ethic. I, you know, I think she'll, she'll probably have a pretty big season in the conference play, but, but I think a lot of their, their struggles have been when she's been off. I think it's so important that that team um, does well um, on a local level because we have some really good young talent coming up in our girls' high school basketball in the metro area, and those kids don't really, uh, right now, give you and I a serious look. Mm -hmm. And uh, they need to elevate their game at you and I, and, and make put themselves in a position where um, kids consider them one of their main options. Well, part of that, that problem is within the borders too. You have two really strong other women's basketball programs. Sure. Iowa and Iowa State both came to the McLeod Center this year, and the attendance. You look in the crowd. There's as many Iowa State and Iowa fans as you and I fans, maybe even more in both of those games. So, so you still have to some work to do to kind of make that imprint. But, but they should be able to get some of those kids that might not be the. The, the Big Ten, Big Twelve level, but but could have some success there in the Missouri Valley. Um, let's talk baseball for a little bit. Um, uh, it's free agent season, uh, trade season, winter meetings, etc. Uh, there's been a lot of player movement, um, uh, both with free agent signings and a handful of trades. I mean, you guys have seen most of what's gone down here. Uh, if you had to point to one transaction um, that you think will make the biggest impact this season, what would it be? 
I'll go with um, uh, San Francisco signing Johnny Cueto. I think uh, if he returns to the Johnny Cueto that the Red Fans like Nelly have seen and that we saw a little bit in the playoffs, that's going to be a, a great deal for them. If, on the other hand, we've seen the last of that, um, then I, then all bets are off. Plus, Plus they, got, they added some RJ as well. So I was going to get to that because that's a signing I, I would think of as the, the iffiest one because we keep waiting for uh, Samarja to be the, the big horse, the, the ace, the guy that can um, uh, carry a pitching staff, and uh, that's not happened really yet. Just glimpses of it, and it didn't happen at all last year at the White Sox. So that's one of those things where either he's going to be uh, wearing a World Series ring or he'll be uh, wearing a uniform in about three years. Nelly, your Cincinnati Reds have pretty much gutted their roster, and from what I read, they're trying to... They're trying to bring up their Louisville, their entire Louisville. They are. They're trying to dump Brandon Phillips now. They're trying to get rid of uh, Jay Bruce. Um, they're trying Aroldis to... Chapman. Yeah. Aroldis seems the biggest one. He's a luxury. They, you know, if they're to do that, he's a luxury they don't have. He, he's their big trader, but now he's he's got this domestic abuse thing hanging over him. I don't know if they're going to be able to move him now because of that. I mean, who? And he's in the last year of his contract, so... I don't think anybody's going to give them anything for him now because there's a good chance he can be sent suspended for half the year. So he's a luxury. I thought he was going to go, and I hope they keep Jay Bruce. He's my favorite player, but he's expensive. So uh, they could move him. They're going young, and they're going to try to. They're going to go the Cubs route. They're going to try to build up with him and have all get all get as many prospects as they can in. And it's going to be four or five year long years. It could be a decade again. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but they're trying to. Brandon Phillips, you know, I, it's heating up to the Washington Nationals because that's where. Uh, uh, Baker's going, Dusty Baker's landed, and uh, him and Brandon have a great relationship, but uh, Brandon would have to waive his no trade clause, full no trade clause, so he can block any trade. So I, I think that's the big sticking point there, otherwise you're going to see him go. Um, they have some young guys they, there that, that they played last year. Zach Kozart will be back, and they can move, uh, move their shortstop over to the second round. But Eugene, uh, I can't pronounce his name. The Latin player they had played shortstop all year, Eugenie Suarez, I believe. So they'll probably switch him over to second if they do move Brandon. The big one they can't move is Joey Votto. He's also got the trade, but I don't think he's going to. That contract's still got seven years left and about $120 million. All right, enough about your Reds. <laughs> Sorry, you, 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 you opened the door. The guy who should really be smiling, Nick, is you um, as a Cubs fan. Um, Ed Zobrist, which is a good, a good uh, ad. Um, you pick up, uh, I think, the biggest impact trade or deal was Jason Hayward signing with the Cubs. I mean, that really solidifies their outfield um, and their lineup. And then they, um, uh, who's the pitcher they picked oh, up? Oh, they John got Lackey, Lackey and, so. and Warren in that trade with uh, the Yankees. So, yeah, Warren's kind of one of those guys that could be, you know, an overlooked piece, too, because he's a guy that came in and started some for the Yankees and, and gave him good production. He's some, one of those flexible guys that can go a long relief out of the bullpen. Um, Lackey, I don't, a lot of people are more excited about Lackey than I am. He's 37. He's kind of a hothead at times. I saw him come unraveled in that playoff game with, with the Cardinals where the Cubs beat him uh, in game four there uh, uh, just this last fall. But, but he has been a really good pitcher in the postseason as well. So, and he knows what it's like to win. He's worked with Western Ross and some of those veterans on the team before. So, so I think he might fit into that clubhouse. But yeah, you're right. You put a guy like Jason Hayward in, in a lineup that's already loaded. It's just a matter of where do you hit him. I mean, if, if you have Hayward as a leadoff hitter maybe, I, I, his on-base percentage, I think, is equivalent to what a leadoff hitter does. Uh, he's, he's had success stealing bags. And then you have Zobris in the two-hole, a guy that's a good contact hitter that can move him around. Um, and Joe Madden really likes those players with lineup flexibility, a lot of moving parts. And Zobris is one of those guys that you can pretty much play anywhere. So I, I think uh, yeah, it's going to be a pretty exciting season there on the north side. I think it is. I mean, if there, were, there was a year when the Cubs were legitimate, threat to win the World Series, uh, this may be it, because they're probably not done. Um, and when we get to the trade deadline, they'll reassess their needs and they'll go out and get what they want. They've got yeah. you know, a ton of money to spend and they're in a great position. And so. as, a, as a Cubs fan, you're just waiting, because you knew when Theo come, came in, there was going to be a moment when they'd open up the checkbook and they've been smart about it. They've built up their, their farm <laughs> system, they brought in some young talent, and now they're, now they're going to be able to spend some money. And, and I think the, the way they've evaluated players has been very successful so it's far. It's been much better. I mean, they opened up the checkbook before, but they went and got players like Alfonso Soriano, yeah, 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 yeah. Aramis Ramirez, yeah. and spent way overspent. Mm -hmm. So good for the Cubs. I mean, unfortunately, Sully, our twins are doing diddly. We got a catcher. I mean, that's yeah, the Yankees, and that's a of catchers. I don't know if the catchers are even in And, and this, no. this name will, will, will get you excited. Darren Mastriani is back. And, uh, for those of you who don't know who Darren Mastriani is, and why would you, he's a, uh, 
he's a, a former twin. Uh, he's been up and down between several organizations. They let him go a couple of years ago, and they signed him to a free agent minor league deal. He won't go away. Yahoo. Uh, well, one uh, thing I saw this morning, looking at some notes, um, they are in the mix to try and acquire Drew Storen, a reliever from the Nationals, mm -hmm. for what that's worth. Yeah, I think he needs to get out of D.C. Uh, he's, he's had a tough time there, especially after Papelbon came. Potentially, at least, he's a guy that could, that could help them. Although the last time they acquired a closer from there, that didn't work out real well. So, Mr. Uh, Caps? Yes. So we'll see if that works out better the this Twins time. always get the short end of every trade they make. I just They're better <laughs> off if they don't make a trade. Yeah, well, the, 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 that, that seems to be the way they're heading, at least. So, All right. So we I got one last thing, baseball related. Now we should need we need to send out our prayers to Claudio Carrasco, a former longtime Waterloo Indian. Uh, he had a severe stroke. He's at the University of Iowa Hospitals. He's had three brain surgeries. I think already, already maybe more. So we're sending prayers out to him. Hope he has a great recovery uh, and uh, can get back because he's a great uh, great youth baseball coach around here and softball coach. And uh, we need him to get well. And uh, we we man, send prayers out for him. Yeah, ditto. I mean, our soft, our fossil softball team also was expressing their uh, sympathies and prayers for him and uh, sending him the best here a few days ago. So he's a good guy. Um, okay, that's going to do it for today. As always, um, you can catch up on all the action uh, at www.wcfcourier.com or in our print editions. We'll be back next week.